Right, uh, we better get started. So, um, my name is Mark Pallon, I'm Professor of Microbial Genomics here, and so it's quite fitting that I'm tasked with giving a lecture on microbial genomics as a general overview of the subject. I've been trying to get the lighting working in here properly, but I, I can't seem to get it dim, but not, uh, you know, it's either bright or off. So I think it's better to have it off than to, to, to have it bright, so to speak. Um, I'm going to read, this lecture's being recorded as a slide cast. It will be available on my YouTube channel from, probably from tomorrow. So if you want to revise it, you can go in and watch it again. Um, there's a handout available, uh, well, the slides are available on uh, a, a website called SlideShare as well. Okay, so let's get started. So what we're going to look at in today's lecture are some of the general features of microbial genomes. We're going to have a historical overview to the subject of genomes, genome sequencing. Then we're going to look in more depth at what it means to sequence a microbial genome, uh, annotate it, analyze it, and so forth. Then briefly cover evolution of genomes uh, before looking at some case studies, perhaps one case study about what did a genome tell us about an organism when we actually sequence the genome sequence. And that will be coming right up to date, up to... Uh, events of last summer uh, in Germany. So you've probably come across genomes before, but you've probably been thinking about the human genome, which is the one that most people latch onto. When we compare microbial genomes with the human genome, we see a number of differences, important differences. So when we look at uh, bacterial genomes, viral genomes, and those of, of fungal pathogens and so on, they are much, much smaller. We're talking about the order of megabase pairs, millions of base pairs of DNA, rather than the billions of base pairs that you'll see in, say, a human genome or an animal genome. And you could argue, you could use the term, what you see is what you get uh, when you apply to these genomes, because basically they're very straightforward. They're, most of the genome consists of genes, protein coding genes, uh, very high gene density, very little space between genes. None of this junk DNA, lots of repetitive DNA you see in the human genome, though that's missing from bacterial genomes. And it also, we hardly ever see introns. We don't see them in protein coding genes in bacteria, um, and we hardly ever see them at all. So it's very much simpler. And the protein coding genes we do see, they're quite short, typically only about a kilobase long, only about a thousand base pairs. Um, so you see the gene in the genome, that gene relates to the protein in a very straightforward way. Um, we often have the genes strung together in strings, uh, which we call operons, where they're under the control of a single regulatory sequence, the promoter, just upstream. So it's very straightforward and simple. And there are fewer of these non-coding RNAs, regulatory RNAs and so on, that you see in the human genome. They're not entirely absent, and in fact, this is a lively area of research in bacteriology, looking at how non-coding RNAs actually may have important roles, but it's still nowhere near as, uh, as large an issue as it is with the human genome. Bacterial genomes, and I'm going to speak mostly about bacterial genomes. I will just briefly mention viral genomes, but most of the time I'll speak about bacterial genomes. In the bacterial genome, we have an important distinction between the chromosomes which are the largest uh, pieces of DNA in the cell. Um, those are usually um, circular, and there's usually only one of them. There are some, I have to put in a few caveats, there are occasionally exceptions to that rule. You do get some bacteria, the Vibrio cholerae has two chromosomes. You do occasionally get chromosomes that are actually linear, for example, in Streptomyces. But, though, but usually they are single, or they're circular, and they're always made of DNA. In rare, rare cases, you can get the two mixed together, circular and linear uh, chromosomes mixed together, but that's small print stuff. Really. Distinct from chromosomes are plasmids. These are generally smaller, uh, typically hundreds of base pa uh, kilobase pairs, tens of kilobase pairs, even down to uh, a few kilobase pairs in, in, in size. These can be circular or linear. They replicate independently from the chromosome. So the copy number of the plasmids is governed completely separately from the copy number of the, uh, of the chromosome. 
Occasionally, they can sort of jump into the chromosome and get integrated into the chromosome. So we do see these kind of this lively, dynamic flux where genes coming in on plasmids and they get integrated from the chromosome, and then just sometimes they pop back out again. Um, but for most of the time, they are maintaining their independence uh, as separate, as we call it, replicons, uh, pieces of DNA that are able to get replicated within the cell. Also, that, that figure there just reminded me to say one important difference also uh, between bacterial cells and eukaryotic cells is obviously in, in the um, bacterial cell, uh, the DNA is free in the cytoplasm. There's no nuclear membrane, there's no nucleus. We sometimes use the term nucleoid to describe the agglomeration of, of DNA, but it's not in a membrane-bound organelle like it is in eukaryotes. The size of bacterial genomes varies somewhat. Uh, those bacteria which have very restricted ecological niches, where their life really doesn't change very much, their lifestyle is simple, they're actually being fed lots of nutrients perhaps uh, in that environment, those tend to have smaller genomes. Uh, and the, the smallest ones of all are those that uh, occur in what we call obligate intracellular parasites or endosymbionts. So, these are bacteria that live within, say, a eukaryotic cell in the cytoplasm of that eukaryotic cell. From that eukaryotic cell, they're scavenging all sorts of, uh, of uh, nutrients. So they don't have to make their own amino acids, let's say. So they tend to have very simple uh, metabolic requirements. They tend, therefore, to have very simple genomes. And if you take this to extreme, in fact, the simplest bacterial genome, I've argued this in print in, in, a, in a kind of provocative piece I wrote a year or two ago, you could argue that mitochondria are actually uh, bacteria, uh, they are clearly descendants of bacteria and they have very, very cut down genomes. Um, in fact, the smallest known conventional bacterial genome, uh, it comes from Carcinella rugii, uh, that is only 160 kilobases, so that's smaller than many viruses. Largest genomes are found in organisms that live in complex environments, for example, organisms that live out in the soil and have to uh, deal with all sorts of different environments, uh, complex developmental cycles and so forth. Uh, Streptomyces is one example. The largest known bacterial genome is from an organism called Serangium cellulosum. That's 13 megabase pairs. Okay, let's now switch briefly to a quick run-through of history, just to, re to anchor bacterial genomes in history. As I said before, bacterial genomes are always made from DNA. That's obvious to us now, but a hundred years ago it wasn't obvious that DNA was the hereditary material, and it was only in the middle part of the 20th century that this uh, was recognised. It was recognised uh, because people did experiments on bacteria. Um, in 1944 it was shown that you could turn one kind of pneumococcus into another by mixing the cells with DNA extracted from uh, one of the, from a pneumococcus. And the DNA alone was enough. And so that established that DNA was the hereditary material. And then this was followed up a few years later when it was shown that if a bacterial virus invades a uh, bacterium and infects it, it's only the DNA of the virus that's getting, getting into the cell. All the proteins and stuff are left outside, and it's only the DNA. So these are two examples where the primacy of DNA as the hereditary material was shown using uh, bacterial genomes. Now I mentioned that I'm not going to say much about viruses, but just in passing, just have to kind of acknowledge that there is a huge profusion of variability out there with viruses. So viruses don't have to use DNA as their genome. There are some viruses that have a, a genome made out of RNA. Pretty much a general rule, though, is that they either go one way or the other. They either have an RNA genome or they have a DNA genome, and they don't just mix and match and have all sorts of things mixed together. And this is quite complicated. I'm just going to skate over it just to give you a flavour of it, but you can actually group viruses into families depending on the kind of genome they have, so whether they have a DNA genome or an RNA genome, also whether it is single-stranded or double-stranded, so a bacterial chromosome is always a double-stranded molecule. 
viruses, you can have single-stranded genomes as well. Um, and there's this complex scheme here, sort of called the Baltimore classification, which actually separates them out into groups depending on how they get to produce mRNA. So in some cases, they will have double-stranded DNA, just like a bacterium, and that makes RNA uh, through a process of transcription in a very straightforward way. That's the simplest case. But in other cases, they might have uh, double-stranded DNA, which turns into single-stranded RNA, which is then turned into mRNA. In some cases, you have um, a genome which is made from RNA, but then that's, translate, uh, that's reverse transcribed back into um, DNA, and then that makes RNA. So it's very complicated, and we're not really going to go into a lot of detail about this at all. Typically for viruses, you're talking a few dozens of genes and a few dozens of uh, killer bases for the genome. The largest genomes in viruses until recently with, were in things like pox viruses, so things like smallpox had, and vaccinia had the largest genomes. We now recognize in the last uh, 10 years or so uh, that there are some very, very large viruses, these so-called megaviruses, uh, Mimi viruses, the, 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 the prototype of these, which actually have genomes of over a megabase uh, pair of DNA, um, and um, these actually uh, overlap with bacteria in terms of genome size. So in terms of understanding microbial genomes, genomics timeline, let's just quickly run through some of the, the milestones. So in, in 1977, Fred Sanger invented uh, DNA sequencing as we now know it. And then a, a couple of years later, we had the first bacteriophage, mitochondrial genome sequence in 81. Um, then Lambda genome was sequenced, uh, Lambda-phage in 1982. And then in the mid-1980s, things went fast forward because there was the invention of automated sequencing using fluorescence instead of radioactivity. And then in the mid-90s, we got the first complete genomes of free-living bacteria. Um, and then a year later, we started getting two genomes from the same species um, and it just continued from there. Uh, we got various genomes coming in, H. pylori, um, two different uh, isolates from the same species. Um, we got all sorts of things going on. I'm not going to go through these in, in detail. Um, uh, but we're now at the stage where we've reached a, a new threshold where sequences become even easier and even cheaper. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Just to, to give some detail there, the first ever genome sequences came from a bacteriophage, and this was an RNA uh, genome, this was an RNA virus, a bacteriophage MS2. So bacteriophage is just a, a name for bacterial viruses, viruses of parasitized bacteria. First gene was sequenced in 1972, and the first genome uh, was in, in 1976. First uh, sequence... DNA genome uh, was a year later with this Phi X uh, 174 in 1977. And then we had to wait uh, uh, nearly 20 years before we actually got to the first genome of a free living organism. And this was a bacterium Haemophilus influenzae um, sequenced uh, by a group of people there. Um, it's not, in fact, not a complete list of the names. Okay. Um, so if we look at a genome project and we want to start sequencing a bacterial genome, what are the stages that we have to go through? Well, first of all, we have to choose a strain to sequence. And when this subject uh, was first starting out 10, 15 years ago, a lot of effort went into this because it was very expensive to sequence genomes. You're talking hundreds of thousands, even a million pounds to sequence a bacterial genome. And so you had to say, right, what is the strain of E. coli we're going to choose? What's the strain of M. tuberculosis? Those uh, issues have largely gone away now, uh, and we just sequence many, many things. It doesn't matter so much. But it was a big issue back then. Then you have to choose a sequencing strategy, and I'm going to go through that in more detail in the, in the, in the subsequent slides. And you have to choose a chemistry. Uh, so you have various choices as to how you do the sequencing. Once you've done this, got the sequence, you then have to assemble all the bits of the sequence together in a process known as assembly. Um, and this was actually a bit of a, a, a bottleneck or a logjam in the process. People just didn't believe you could actually assemble a whole genome from all, lots and lots of fragments 
tens of thousands of fragments. Um, but there, are, there is now available software that allows you to do this fairly straightforwardly and easily. Problem is that when you try and assemble a genome from all those bits of sequence you've got, you never ever get the whole genome in one contiguous piece of sequence. There will always be the DNA left in fragments. And closing the gaps between those fragments is known as finishing. Um, and that is actually very, very manually intensive. So for sequencing and for assembly, we can automate these things, and they're very quick and easy. So you can get 99% of a genome very quickly. The last 1%, closing all those gaps, can take as long, if not longer, than your initial sequencing. So it's kind of slightly counterintuitive there. There are issues about data release. Do you publish straight away? Do you release your data into the, into the public domain? Uh, those, are, again, is a tendentious issue. Annotating the sequence, as we say, as we'll see in a moment, the sequence on its own doesn't really mean much to people. You have to go through and try and make sense of the sequence, and then you end up getting a publication. And when this subject started out 15 years ago, people would get a nature paper or science paper from a bacterial genome sequence. Nowadays, you're lucky to get a paper anywhere from a single bacterial genome sequence. You can get a 500-word 500, note in the Journal of Bacteriology currently, and that might not last much longer. So this field is, is moving very fast forward, huge progress. Let's just go back in history just to... I, I'm not sure how much of this kind of stuff you've been taught before, but just to briefly touch on the technologies. So the first genome sequences were done using Sanger sequencing. This is Fred Sanger, picture here. Uh, he's still alive. He lives out in Cambridgeshire. He's now retired long ago. He's, I think he's in his 90s now. But he came up with this idea that you can actually sequence DNA using, this, using a primer and then extending uh, the DNA with a polymerase. But he also came up with a, unique, uh, a neat trick, which was that he spiked the reactions. Instead of having four of the normal DNTPs, he set up four reactions and he spiked each one of them uh, with a dideoxy uh, uh, nucleotide. Um, and that actually, what that did was it stopped the reaction at that point. And so what you end up with is if you do these kind of reactions, you end up with a, a series of molecules here that terminated at, at, at a particular base. Um, you have to get the proportions just right so that you end up getting the, the things extended, but every now and then uh, terminating uh, with a particular base. And in this way, you can read off a sequence. I'm not going to go into detail through this. You've probably had your talks in this elsewhere. Automated sequencing came in a few years later, and that's, so that made things a lot quicker when we actually used dyes rather than radioactivity. But another key feature of sequencing genomes is this idea of having a whole genome shotgun approach. So even with the best Sanger sequencing, you're not getting more than a few hundred base pairs of sequences, maybe a thousand, maybe a kilobase of sequence in your sequencing reaction. Uh, so with a thousand base pairs and you've got a genome of a million base pairs, there's no way you can sequence a whole genome in one go like that. So what you do is you break the genome down into lots and lots of fragments, just randomly shear up that genome, which is the idea of what's called a shotgun, it's just a kind of random process, shear it all up, and you, you then clone uh, those fragments into a plasmid vector and propagate those plasmid vectors in a bacteria, in E. coli, um, pick colonies that represent each plasmid, and then put those into microtiter plates, using colony picking robots. And then what you do is you just sequence the insert uh, in that plasmid. And the neat trick here is that you can use a primer from the plasmid, which is actually present in all the plasmids, a universal primer, and that will then sequence into this piece of unknown DNA that you've cloned into the plasmid. And you can do that on maybe 30,000 individual clones, 30,000 different plasmids. And in this way, you will sample the whole genome, and you will get the sequence from everywhere in that genome. If you think about it, there's just lots and lots of pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and in that way, you actually get the whole genome covered. Now, you might think, well, that's a huge effort, isn't it, to do all that sequencing, 30,000 or whatever. 
The point is you can actually automate this. So it's not actually as difficult as you might think. It seems counterintuitive to go and sequence 30,000 things. Surely there must be better ways. But in fact, this has turned out to be the breakthrough, the easiest way. Another important breakthrough came uh, about five years ago with the development of what we call high-throughput sequencing. And this has actually kind of started to mark the end of the dominance of Sanger sequencing in this area. These technologies are at least 100 times faster, 100 times cheaper, probably now 1,000 times faster and cheaper than traditional Sanger technology. And there are a range of these different technologies. You may hear these words thrown around 454, Illumina, Iron Torrent, PacBio. And these techniques rely on fundamentally different approaches, different approaches in, in terms of chemistry, but also just different approaches in how you get your template for sequencing. So instead of doing what we used to have to do, the whole genome shotgun approach with the Sanger approach, where we propagated in plasmids inside living cells, with these approaches, you create lots and lots of molecular colonies, if you like, and you use those as template, and you parallelize the whole thing, but you're doing it all in vitro. You're not cloning any E. coli anymore. So same kind of thing. You take a chromosome, you shear it up, you then add adapters. So you ligate on adapters to, each, to the end of each of these molecules, um, and then amplify up and sequence uh, those uh, sequences using primers based on those adapters. That's in general terms how most of these approaches work, at least. To give you more details, 454 sequencing, this is, uses what we call emulsion PCR. Uh, have you had any lectures on PCR up till now? Have you heard of PCR? Well, this is a method where basically what you do here is you take those fragments, those bits of DNA where you've, you've stuck on um, adapters on either end, just lots and lots of random pieces of DNA with adapters stuck on. You then stick those uh, into um, an emulsion. So you make an emulsion where those, those DNA molecules are stuck in with these beads that have adapters, uh, sequences complementary to the adapters you've put on. And then you do an amplification step. So I haven't got time to go through, if you haven't done PCR, I really haven't got time to go into detail about this. But basically, through some chem clever chemistry, you can actually make mo many, many copies of that starting template. So you can amplify it up. So you end up with that, that bead being coated in lots and lots of copies of identical DNA sequence. And then those are then sequenced by a process known as pyrosequencing. And again, I think we don't need to dwell on the details here. But here what happens is you, you get the same kind of thing where the, uh, the, your DNTPs are going in. Uh, and as part of that process, you get the release of pyrophosphate. Um, and this, uh, you then detect that through a particular enzymatic cascade. And this ends up with you producing light. So if a base is incorporated at a particular stage, a flash of light comes out. And that's what you detect in this kind of sequencing. But the thing is that you can massively parallelize this. So you can have hundreds of thousands or even millions of reactions all on one small uh, chip or plate uh, and actually then read all those in parallel. Illumina sequencing is an alternative to 454 where you do the same kind of thing. You stick adapters onto the end of fragments of DNA. Um, but here, it, instead of using those beads and, and so on, you actually stick those fragments down on a two-dimensional surface. But this two-dimensional surface has been coated with a lawn of primers that are uh, either the same as the adapters you've got or are complementary to them. And what happens is that you get your piece of DNA with its DNA fragment in there that you want to sequence with its two adapters uh, stuck on that surface, but it's free to kind of flap around, if you like, in the solvent. And every now and then, part of it will, the end of it will come in contact with one of those primers that's stuck nearby on the surface. And this will prime the production of a complementary strand through a DNA polymerase. Um, and when that happens, you then end up with twice as much DNA as you started with. So that piece of DNA in the middle there that we're trying to replicate, there's now two copies of that. Okay, one's complementary to the other, but there's two copies of essentially the same information. And the great thing is that you can then dissociate those. You've got then two molecules sitting there flapping around. And then you, they can go through the same cycle again. 
they can find new partners in the neighborhood, hook up with those, you get a new round of priming. And in the end, after a few cycles of this, you end up with a cluster of DNA um, on this surface where all the DNA molecules in that cluster have the same sequence or are complementary to that same sequence. And then you have lots and lots of template for sequencing and you can detect that. Enough about chemistry and biochemistry, you probably had enough of that. Let's now look at the issues involved in putting all this jigsaw together. As I mentioned, you end up getting lots and lots and lots of sequences, uh, and then you have to thread them all together to make your whole genome sequence. So what we do is we try and assemble them into a single contiguous uh, or continuous genome sequence. And we often use the term contig to describe contiguous pieces of DNA. And the whole idea of shotgun sequencing is that you look for overlaps between these sequences, and through those overlaps you infer the ordering of the sequences uh, as you work through. So you can see here in this kind of comic view here, this is just looking at a very simplistic kind of assembly problem where you've got that handful of sequences there and you assemble it together and you end up with a clear idea of what the original starting sequence must have looked like. Now this works very well, surprisingly well. You can actually get very good assemblies uh, in, and get tens or hundreds of thousands of base pairs of DNA assembled nicely together using these kind of approaches. There is a problem though, which is that if you have repetitive DNA, repetitive sequences in your library, in your genome, then it's become very hard to assemble. And in fact, it becomes impossible in certain cases to assemble across those repeats. Um, and this is why when we try and assemble a genome, we never get the whole genome coming out in one fragment. It'll always, it'll always be broken where there are some repeats in the genome. And that's where you have to go in and do manual approaches or other approaches to get, um, to get the whole thing contiguous. One neat trick that is used to get around this problem of, of repeats and trying to help with the assembly process is so-called paired end sequencing. So you can take the bacterial chromosome, you can shear it up, but instead of getting very, very small fragments that you're going to sequence all the way through, you actually go for quite large fragments, say three kilobases or eight kilobases, and then you add linkers to those, and then you circularize uh, that, that molecule, and then you chop out the bit where, around the linker and then you sequence, add adapters to that and then sequence that. So you end up with two bits of DNA, two bits of sequence, which you know are about eight kilobases apart in the genome. Um, and you, you don't get much sequence off them. You mainly get 100, 200 base pairs of sequence. But nonetheless, they kind of act as landing lights, if you like, to help you try to get this thing assembled. Uh, and so it makes it much easier to assemble the genome when you have uh, these kind of paired end sequences in there. So this is what you kind of get to. You have a genome assembly where you've, you're sequencing bits of sequence. Uh, you're running in from either end, let's say, uh, and um, you end up lots of overlapping sequence coming together to give you what we call contigs. Um, and that's what happens if you, if you just do normal whole genome shotgun. If you um, have paired end sequencing going on where you've got uh, a sequence gap between two contigs, but you know that there, you know the distance apart of those two bits of sequence. You know you've got a three kilobase fragment, and they're at either end, so they're three kb apart, or you've got an eight kilobase fragment, or whatever. That, if you can then close that sequence gap, uh, you end up with a scaffold. So we we can then assemble the genome into scaffolds, where we might not know exactly what the sequence is in that gap, but we know how those the order of those contigs. There will be some cases, though, where there's a physical gap, where there may be a part of the genome where you really cannot resolve it. And that's, where, again, where you have to then go in and do uh, manual things, and, and it becomes much harder. Sometimes it's too hard, and we don't bother to do assemblies. If, if some sequencing technologies give very short reads, very short read lengths, they give us massive throughput, lots and lots of sequence, but in very, very small chunks. And in those cases, we sometimes say, well, it's not worth trying to, what we call, do, do a de novo assembly, to put all this stuff together from scratch without any clues. What we'll do is we'll just compare it to something which we know is very, very similar. And this is called resequencing. 
Um, or, or, um, so this is a, rather if you have a jigsaw puzzle uh, and you use the lid of the jigsaw puzzle to orientate all the pieces, it makes the whole thing a lot easier if you have that there to, to align against. And that's the same kind of approach. Um, so, you know, I don't know why I've got animations here. So instead of doing an assembly, we do this resequencing and we map against a reference genome. Now, another key point is that we have to annotate the genome. So once we've gone through all that assembly business and we've got the genome as close as we can to a single contiguous molecule, we then have to think, well, what does this all mean? About what, what can we conclude about the biology of the organism from this genome sequence? And, and, and the job of annotation uh, is to actually give biological meaning to that sequence. So there's a whole number of things that we can look for. We can look uh, for coding sequences. We can look for uh, function, and I'll say more about that in a minute. We use homology as a, as, as a way of doing that. Various other features. Let's go through all those in detail now. In effect, we, if we look at a genome sequence, it looks something like this. And I don't think any of you here, uh, unless you're like kind of Rain Man, are going to be able to look at that and say, oh yes, I can see a gene for X or Y here, and that starts there and it ends there. It's just beyond human wit. I mean, sometimes you might do it manually just to get a feel for it, but we couldn't do that normally. And what we want instead is we want to go to something like this, where we've got the genome marked up in a... Uh, particular way so that it can be understood by humans and understood by computers in a consistent fashion. So here we've got, FT stands for feature table, and we've got here, for example, a piece of DNA uh, which encodes a protein called DNAA. And there you've got the translation of that gene there in, in, encapsulated in the, in the annotation. In fact, we can go beyond that. We can actually have graphical views of bits of the genome so we can see the orientation of the genes, we can see how big they are, um, we can see other features like maybe how much, uh, what the, the nucleotide composition of those genes is. Uh, we can look at the whole genome and get a whole genome kind of atlas uh, if we do the annotation and the analysis correctly. One point that's worth noting is, I mean, it, with bacterial genomes, although they're, they're very straightforward and simple, um, it sometimes can be hard to identify the protein coding genes, and a lot of people just use the term ORF to talk about the, the, the protein coding genes. This here is what we call an ORF map of the genome. So if we think of a, a DNA sequence, you've actually got six different reading frames in which that DNA sequence can be possibly translated into proteins. And what this ORF map shows you here are those six reading frames and within those reading frames, wherever there's a stop code on, there's a vertical line there. So you can see that some parts of uh, a reading frame have got lots and lots of stop codons. And so it's very unlikely that there's a protein coding gene there. Uh, and if there was, it would have to be a very, very small one. But you can see these long stretches where there are no stop codons. Those are what we call open reading frames. So a stretch of DNA that can encode a protein without a stop code and interrupting it. Unfortunately, it's not quite so straightforward as just finding the open reading frames. If you look at this here, in turquoise are actually annotated the protein coding genes in this region. Well, they're not projecting in turquoise on there for some reason, but uh, they are um, these, these blocks here, these arrows. And in fact, you can see on some, uh, on some of the other strands, there are great stretches there which are free of um, stop codons are open reading frames, but they're not actually what gets translated into the sequence. So we have to be quite sophisticated. And we use sophisticated computer programs to actually predict what a protein coding gene looks like and actually annotate the genome correctly, identifying the genes um, as we go through. Another problem you get when you're trying to look at these genomes uh, is the problem of frame shifts. So if you think about how uh, a piece of DNA, this is just looking at three reading frames here, simplifying things, but if you look at the way this piece of DNA can be translated into proteins, you can see that the, the top line there, that reading frame there, that's intact all the way through. Um, in the other reading frames, you can see those dots, those dots are stop codon, so those reading frames are disrupted. 
But the correct reading frame, the one that's actually turned into a protein, is on the top there. But if you put in just one base pair into that sequence, instead of it having a small effect, you know, just one base pair out of 100 or whatever, it's not going to make, or 70, it's not going to make much difference. What that does is it pushes that sequence, uh, that translated sequence, out of frame. And so you end up with the DNA being translated in, in the latter part of it there, the latter two-thirds, being translated into a completely different sequence entirely. Now this happens in two contexts. This actually happens in nature. You do get mutations which do this, called frame shift mutations, which will, just from one base pair, radically alter the sequence of a protein. But it also is a common problem that if you're sequencing technology and, and your uh, alignments and, uh, and assembly have not done, been done perfectly, sometimes you can't tell the difference between three A's in a row, four A's in a row, five A's in a row, and you end up with these, this, this problem of frame shift errors in your sequence. Another important um, tool that we use in, in trying to analyze genomes is the idea of homology, sequence homology. And these are, homology in this context can be defined as similarities in form, in, the, in terms of the sequence, that allow us to infer similarities in, if you like, meaning, in terms of structure and function. Let's take a, an analogy from languages. So, you may not speak a word of German. You may not understand the German language. But if we see those two sentences there, English sentence and then a German sentence, and we see the words aligned with each other, and in fact the, the words with equivalent meaning that look similar as well, and actually have common ancestry back in, in, in the time when English and German had a common ancestor, you can start to infer, um, make inferences about the, the meaning of those words in German and the structure of that German sentence without actually knowing German, never actually been explicitly taught it. Um, and this kind of reasoning is, you know, this is linear B, a, a, an ancient form of Greek, which was decoded using similar kind of reasoning. And we can do that same kind of thing with biological sequences. Um, it's important to note that homology is not just sequence similarity. It's just not that sequences are similar. It means that they have a common ancestor. It's similarity that arises, without, uh, uh, arises from descent from a common ancestor. And... In this corner here, we've just got a, frag a fragment of a protein sequence here from different organisms, and that piece of the sequence there has been aligned, and you can see from that alignment there are some parts of the sequence which are absolutely conserved in, in different bacteria, in different enzymes and different bacteria. So you can see the T and the C, this is threonine and cysteine and the single letter code for amino acids, are absolutely conserved. Uh, other positions you can see there are some differences. There are some places where there's a different residue in each of the four sequences. But looking at these kind of patterns of similarity, we can start to make inferences about function of the proteins that we're looking at. Worth stressing, there are two kinds of homology. We can have so-called orthologs and paralogs, depending on whether the, the homology... Sometimes you get duplication of a gene within the same genome, and that we call um, paralogs. Or you can get similarity between two things, say a gene in E. coli and a gene in Salmonella will look similar because they're coming from a common ancestor of those two genomes, those two cells. And a key thing we do is homology searching, where we actually take a protein that we've got, a sequence of it, and then we search it against all the other known protein sequences known to man, and we look for matches. And if we find something that looks interesting, uh, we can then start to make inferences about the uh, function of the protein. Well, I'm starting to run out of time, so we're going to have to run through bacterial genome dynamics fairly quickly. How do bacterial genomes change over time? Well, they change in, in three basic ways. They can lose genes, they can gain genes, and genes can change slowly over time through mutation. Um, and just one key point that we need to get across is that in bacterial genomes... One dominant feature that you don't see, if you're, say, looking at mammalian genomes, comparing a human and a rat or a mouse, what we see with bacterial genomes is massive horizontal gene transfer. So instead of genes just being passed on from mother cell to daughter cell in an orderly fashion, a bacterium can actually s s transmit genes from one cell to another horizontally. Um, and um, we see this on lots of what we call mobile genetic elements. So they're... Uh, a whole range of these 
which allow DNA to move from one place in the genome to another place in the genome, to move from a chromosome to a plasmid. The plasmid can actually move from one cell to another, and so we end up uh, with these things moving around. Bacteriophages are another example where these bacterial viruses can carry DNA around. Um, and another feature that we sometimes see in bacterial genomes are so-called genomic islands. So these are large chromosomal regions in the genome where you get lots of genes all stuck together, maybe dozens of genes, and these jump into a genome and provide that genome suddenly, that cell suddenly, with a quantum leap to a new phenotype. So bacteria don't have to slowly, gradually evolve their way to some new phenotype. They, some, they can acquire external DNA, that DNA can come in, and they can get dozens or even hundreds of genes in a single go, taking them in a quantum leap up to a new uh, phenotype. Nearly finished now. There's just a, a few more terms we need to get across. When we look at genomes, if we say look at, say, E. coli, we can say that all E. coli um, genomes contain a set of genes that are the same, that we call the core genome. But if you look at any given E. coli strain, it will have some genes that are particular to that strain and aren't found in other E. coli. Those we call the accessory genome. And we use the word pan-genome to talk about all the genes that are present in all the genomes in E. coli, so all the possible genes that an E. coli could have. And then we use the term metagenome, takes us one step above that. Let's say we took a sample of soil and we extracted the bacterial DNA from that soil. There may be many thousands of different species in there, but we call that sum of all those genomes in there the metagenome. To illustrate this idea of core and pangenomes, here's a figure from the early days of, of sequencing back in 2002, where we had the first glimpse of three different kinds of E. coli. And what they found was that the genes that were common to each of those strains, one that was not pathogenic, one that caused urinary tract infection, and one that caused infection in the bowel, that only 40, just under 40% of the genes uh, in, that, in, in that pan genome were actually present uh, in the core genome, in every strain. And each strain had its own set of genes that was particular to, to that strain. Just again mentioning metagenomics, and this is a big growth area as well, that sometimes people are actually interested in just uh, sequencing all the DNA in a sample. And again, you might say, well, this is a bit silly, isn't it? Kind of brute force approach. I rather like whole genome shotgun, but in fact this is an area of great growth interest because it's very technically, technically very easy to do, just extract DNA and sequence it. The analysis is much harder, but people are trying to work on that. Okay, so the last few minutes, I'm going to answer the question, what are you going to use a genome sequence for when you've got one? Well, you can discover new genes, get lots of new hypotheses. So you sequence a genome, you can see a you didn't realise there was a toxin gene in there. You can go and then investigate the toxin gene. Oh, there might be an antibiotic resistance gene in there you never expected. There might be all sorts of things you never expected to see in that genome. And then you go on and investigate those uh, one by one in the lab. You can compare genomes and, and look at how strains are spreading through a hospital, let's say. And you can do what we call functional genomics, where you can look uh, at, you use the genome as a starting point for global experiments looking at, say, the transcriptome, the genes that are actually being transcribed, the proteome, all the proteins that are produced in the cell, um, and so forth. I'm going to give you one case study from, from last year, which I was involved in, very interesting study. Uh, this was, you may have heard in the news last year, there was an outbreak of what we call hemolytic uremic syndrome in Germany. And this is produced by a particular kind of E. coli called sugar toxin-producing E. coli, or STEC. Um, and this causes bloody diarrhea, causes damage to the kidneys and brain, also causes damage um, to red cells, leading to anemia and, and, and loss of platelets. And there was this massive outbreak in Germany uh, last, last year, in May and July, over 4,000 cases, over 40 deaths, linked to sprouting seeds, um, particularly focused in northern Germany. And I was uh, very lucky to be involved in the team a, one of three teams, in fact, that were, that were sequencing the genome of this outbreak strain. And we got a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last summer uh, looking at the genome sequence of this E. coli isolate. Here is myself and, and some one of my colleagues 
uh, drinking with our German collaborators in Hamburg uh, after we get the paper out. And what did we find? Well, we realised that when we sequenced the genome of this, this strain, you know, strain something appeared, burst out into Germany, nobody knew where it had come from. We realised that actually it wasn't a completely new strain. There was something similar had been seen in Germany 10 years before, something similar had been seen in Korea. Um, and curiously, the closest strain for which there was a complete genome had actually uh, come from the Central African Republic. So basically, these bacteria are actually spreading across the globe uh, very vast distances. And we also, it was also clear from the genome that this gene, this STEC, came from a, a kind of E. coli lineage that was circulating in humans, not just coming from animals. Uh, and this was uh, rather unexpected. And we saw lots and lots of things happening in the genome in terms of evolution, lots of, of these mobile genetic elements jumping into the genome, lots of differences. A lot of prophages, so these are bacteria, bacterial viruses that have stuck themselves, in, pasted themselves into the genome. Um, we saw antibiotic resistance in this genome where there was no previous use of antibiotics. So it was a very, uh, this is a, a kind of map of all those things, those things that changed in the genome compared to its closest uh, genome sequence relative. And in fact, the, one of the messages we said in terms of takeaway messages from this project was that actually we could tell an awful lot from sequencing the genome. Uh, we could actually get a lot of insights into this, uh, the, the biology of this organism, its evolution and its epidemiology just from sequencing its genome. Not doing any other experiments on it, but just getting the DNA out and sequencing it. And the other key point is that I mentioned high throughput sequencing, but over the last six months or so, certainly last year or so, we've seen the advent of what we call benchtop sequencing where we're getting instruments that are, will just fit onto the top of a bench, like a laser printer in size, and give you genome sequences within a day, uh, even a few hours, of starting out. So this whole area is in, a, in, in great uh, moving forward. Uh, and lots of interesting things going on. People are actually trying to sequence everything in the human microbiome. So all the different bacteria that live on humans, people are systematically going through and trying to genome sequence them. Uh, in fact, some people are saying, let's go out and sequence the whole tree of life. Go and sample the most odd and disparate and strange organisms from the most strange environments and fill in every gap in our understanding of the tree of life. And there, there are movements on this score as well. I'll leave you with one last thought, which is actually at the moment, we're in a state of like permanent revolution with genome sequencing. The, the ability to sequence genomes is getting quicker and easier all the time. And a time is coming when it will be so easy to sequence things that we'll just do it because we can. And here's one example from the recent literature. What these guys did was they wanted to, they had a metagenomics pipeline where they would analyze uh, a metagenome and they wanted to be able to see what, take a complex mixture of DNA from lots of different organisms and work out what was in there. And to test their bioinformatics pipelines, what they did was they got their car and they just drove up the motorway uh, and when they got home, they scraped all the gunk off the windscreen that had been collected uh, and they mashed that up, extracted DNA, and then they analysed it. Now, you, you think, well, that's a mad thing to do, but because sequencing is so cheap and so easy, actually, it provided them with a perfectly good test case to test out their pipelines, and they found human DNA in there, they found insect DNA in there, they found plant DNA in there, they found bacterial DNA in there, and it, and it all tested their pipelines really well. Okay, that's me finished. Um, I'm overrun by about three or four minutes. I'm happy to take any questions now if there are any. Otherwise, I'd remind you that this will all be available on the internet uh, very soon.